All right, so it looks like we are live. What's up, Action Tribe? AJ here, host and founder of My Seven Chakras, my7chakras.com, the place where we help you calm your mind, relax your nervous system, and experience deep states of bliss. In today's episode, we talk about some really fascinating and exciting topics, such as detoxification, mindfulness, the history of Ayurveda, and how to look and stay young for a long time. So if you'd like to explore these topics and also support our efforts, then make sure that you hit the subscribe button on your iPhone because it does something special to the algorithm so that people who would nor normally not come across our podcast, they are able to see it. Uh, and that happens once you hit the subscribe button or if you're on Spotify, make sure that you hit follow right? Because that is that small step that you can take to help us spread the word. And before we listen to, to what Salila, our guest, has to say, and I'm going to introduce her, let's listen to our latest iTunes review by Gabby Sandy. It's been a while since I've read a, read a review, but here goes. Hey, AJ, you're a champ. have to say that during these unique times, I've decided to pivot into dedicating myself to pursue and push through taking action into things that are positive and which provide personal self-growth and fulfillment. This has been great for me and has brought joy to my heart. I do have to thank you for being a stepping stone in this personal journey I'm working through, sending you a million blessings. So thanks a lot, Gabby, for writing this review. If you would like to write your own review and for me to read it out, go to my 7 forward slash review. That's my 7 forward slash review and write your own version of your review. With that being said, let's bring on our special guest for today, Salila Sukumaran. So Salila Sukumaran is an Ayurveda health coach through her wellness travel concierge, Ayur Gamaya. Salila provides personalized Ayurveda and yoga wellness journeys to India and Bali for an immersive experience. For her work in promoting yoga and Ayurveda, she was recognized as an ambassador by Ayush, India's health ministry. And she's from an Ayurvedic lineage from Kerala, South India, and shares her knowledge through events in uh, SF Bay Area. She's also learned Ayurveda from elders in her family and enjoys demonstrating how simple rituals can indeed create profound shifts in overall health. So, Salila, welcome to our show. Thank you so much, AJ. It's such a pleasure to be here. <laughs> I'm really excited about this conversation because, as you know, as a breathwork instructor, I'm really looking for ways to help us optimize our health. And yes. yoga is one part. But then mm -hmm. you have the sister science of Ayurveda and you've yeah. got Tantra and all these wonderful ancient uh, scientific scientific approaches mm -hmm. to health and wellness and self-realization. Uh, and people like yourself help add a lot of value. So I really appreciate you joining us on today's session. Yeah, it reminds me of this uh, saying that, you know, yoga is a good girl, is uh, focused on, on the life after death renunciation and getting rid of this worldly troubles. And Ayurveda is a fun girl who not just goes to heaven, she goes everywhere. She is a, she's the bad girl, but in a good way. Yeah, yeah, of course. So maybe we could start with talking about what are the fun elements of Ayurveda? Ayurveda is everything about pursuing our desires. Ayurveda is about life on this planet. Ayurveda is just accepting that we are human and that we have to follow dharma, artha, kama, moksha. Moksha is just one thing we are following. A yogi follows moksha as his one and only. Everything is aligned towards moksha, enlightenment. Whereas an Ayurvedic practitioner, someone who follows Ayurveda, is a householder who's saying, I am a steward of this planet. I am a head of my community. My goals, my desires, my wishes for wealth, for prosperity, for peace, for growth is all valid just as much as my uh, desire for enlightenment is valid. And my enlightenment will come through love and community and taking care, good care of this body that God has gifted me with. That is the fundamental difference between yoga and Ayurveda. Interesting. And I think this is very relevant for people listening to our episode right now, because 
um, most of our listeners are people who are part of a family and they have responsibilities and, and roles that they need to play. And uh, sometimes, you know, reading about stories and reading books, one might feel like, yeah, yoga is all about, uh, you know, retreating to the mountains and leading a secluded, a very highly disciplined life. Uh, but as you pointed out, there's that's one path for sure. But then there are other paths also where you can pursue your desire. You can really take control of your body, but also take control of your mind. So looking at it holistically, uh, you know, and so let's talk about the beginning now. Where were you born and, and brought up? I was born into a military family. So I was born in the west of India in a state called Gujarat. Uh, so I'm a good Jew by birth, um, but I grew up all over India. So I grew up in the north in Kashmir. I grew up in the south in Kerala. I grew up in the east. So I grew up in at least eight different regions of India. And the blessing of growing up in so many diverse places of India, you yourself uh, are of Indian origin, I'm guessing. So um, you know that each state of India is like an independent country in itself. Distinct culture, cuisine, people, temperament, it's all so different. So growing up in all these parts of India helped me do what I do now, is respect for other cultures and cuisines and tying it all together into Ayurveda. Yeah, that's very interesting. I mean, the unique thing about India is that, you know, you go from state to state, city to city, and you notice so many different things and also obviously strings that sort of bind us and tie us together. Uh, but I remember having friends who were, you know, uh, whose parents were in the army, either one of mm -hmm. them or both of them. And there was a lot of travel involved, right? And I think one of the benefits is not just the exposure that you get to different cultures and you know, and, and people, but also you, you get to become more resilient, right? I mean, exactly. the challenge definitely is that you don't get to have the social circle that you're part of. And whenever you take time to build that social circle or maybe have that best friend, mm -hmm. it's you get uprooted and then you go to somewhere else, right? Yeah, yeah. It trains you to become a lifelong gypsy. That's true. That's very true. And that perhaps is uh, the spiritual path that Sometimes people take voluntarily and sometimes it's involuntary. Uh, but what influence did your, did your parents play then, especially in the first uh, seven years of your life? Wow. Mm. I think they gave me the grounding of just uh, unconditional acceptance and support. Uh, they gave me the grounding of knowing that even though we were in several different places, uh, we were very South Indian, so I grew up learning, speaking my language. Um, there was, I was pretty much left to roam wild in my first seven years because I think mother had two more children after me, so she was busy with that. So in a way, I was not schooled or civilized till I was eight or ten. So that was a great gift for me. I still have a very... Uh, you know, I, I look at things and I don't quite, I question everything a lot. You know, I'm not someone who quickly buys into the program or believes in the set, you know, schedule or rule. I'm always the one saying, why, why should we do that? Why not mm -hmm. something else? I believe that comes from my wild upbringing, <laughs> my unsupervised childhood. Yeah, that's very interesting because I think uh, some people get confused, right? Um, when you think about, you know, religion, one term that people associate with religion is faith, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Is is this, uh, you know, sometimes it might be interpreted as as belief. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think in a lot of uh, cultures in India, especially yoga, and Ayurveda, and Tantra, mm -hmm. all over the Vedas, there was this encouragement to ask questions, right? Yeah. is to not just assume that what somebody has told you is the truth, but to use that as, as support, but also to question the truth. And we can go back to the Vedas, the Rig Veda, the Nasatya Suk Sukta was all about asking questions, right? And exactly. towards the end, they also question who is God and maybe he right. doesn't know. <laughs> 
I so, love that about our Vedas. I love that debating aspect. Even if almost every uh, classic written in Ayurveda also begins the same way, where these amazing giants of intellectual you know, power, prowess, are questioning each other and debating each other and outright saying, nope, you got that wrong. This is what I believe. So I love that. <laughs> Yeah, and I think debate is a skin it, skill in itself, right? Because mm -hmm. the assumption in a debate is that not everyone's going to agree with you. And right now, we're in a climate where not everyone is going to agree with you. But I think a lot of people are resorting to canceling the other person or unfriending the other person. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you look at what has happened in India, I think one of the reasons why the Vedic philosophy was so advanced was because for thousands of years, you would have the Vedic scholars debating with some of the Buddhist scholars, right? Mm -hmm. And so you had these extensive debates where it was not about, I'm going to attack you physically, but it was right. a very refined, uh, you know, intellectual, intellectually stimulated, curiosity-based debate. And right. at the end, both parties would reach to a different level of understanding, exactly. which is what we did, exactly. I guess, right now. <laughs> I love that. I love that about our culture. And so what did you want to become when you were a kid? As you look back at your life. What did I want to be when I was a kid? Many people wanted me to be many different things. My grandma would say, you become a nurse because you are so good at taking care of. I used to take care of her when she was sick. So she would say, you become a nurse. My parents would be like, you become a doctor because you are so smart. Um, Friends would say, oh, you become a movie star. It'd be so fun, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it'd be different things like that. But I did not want to be anything. I just wanted to run away to the forest and just be under the trees. And uh, I think my happiest memories were just uh, digging myself in the sand and just feeling the sand over my body and just watching the sun filter through the leaves and just feeling one with the sun and the leaves and the air and those were my most beautiful moments when I could just run away to the forest and explore plants and just just be nothing and nowhere and just just be. Right. Yeah, that's that's really, really um, interesting. And I think a lot of children, including myself, had this really amazing fascination for nature, for mm -hmm. trees, for animals, for, uh, you know, the river and lakes and whatever you know, universe has to offer. I remember my own parents used to take me, um, you know, outdoors on picnics and this and that, especially when I was, when we were young. Mm -hmm. And those were the best moments where mm -hmm. it was about nothing. Like, like you said, it was about not going anywhere, but just being in the present moment yeah, and enjoying it. Absolutely. Cool. And so you mentioned that you're, you know, you know, you come from a lineage of, people who were um, teaching, but also sharing Ayurveda, mm -hmm. right? And then when you were young, I think your grandmother, you know, taught you some aspects of Ayurveda or some principles of Ayurveda, but at first you didn't take it seriously, right? Mm -hmm. So in those days, when you were young, what sort of made you have that attitude towards Ayurveda back then? And then what changed it? So my grandmother never formally taught me anything. My grandmother just did what she did. And the elders in my family did what they did. You know, when, yeah. when something goes wrong, words like vata, pitta, kapha is a normal part of their vocabulary. So that's what they use to say, oh, this is going wrong. Therefore, feed this or heal this way or mm -hmm. when they're talking about their own health. So they never, you're growing up in a house you're speaking English, you never say this is A, this is B, this is C, right? You do not say those things. You just speak English because that's what everybody speaks. Mm. So when I was with my grandmother, she was the most fascinating human being I had ever known because she seemed to be the way I was when I was in my forest looking at plants and the way I was to explain this, the feeling I got when I was with in the forest looking at the plants and the sunlight and exploring is what I saw her doing constantly. You know, she was cooking in the kitchen. She was throwing interesting things together. She was 
as she was cooking the lunch, she was also cooking a healing herb or a spice or some kind of mix or an oil. And she would walk by the pond and she would throw some things into the pond so it would rot and then she can make a mats out of it. So she could sun dry pills on top of those fresh mats. She would be plucking herbs all the time and drying them or grinding them. So she was constantly 15 things would be going on around it, which was fascinating to a six year old and eight year old. And I was like her shadow watching her. Mm. And no one would, only my mother would impose things on me like, oh, you have to take a bath, you have to apply oil, you have to come out of the sun, this will increase your bata, this will make your kapha bad. You know, those words they use to uh, show that, you know, you might get sinus infection or you might get anxiety, you might not be able to sleep at night or you might get body ache, therefore come out and do this, which is better. I would get forced by her. So I would reject all that and I would think she was she was kind of strange and weird and I would mm -hmm. reject that knowledge. And yeah. I would want to be like my peers at school who did not follow any of these things. You know, they, uh, they did not apply oil to their hair all the time. Uh, they did not speak these words. I mentioned something about an Ayurveda oil in class that it was, I, I had applied some oil on my body and it was smelling. So I said, this smells like the Ayurveda oil that my grandmother sent for me. And everybody was like, ew, that smells gross. So I was like, oh my God, shut down. This part is not allowed. This part is not to be visible outside. So hide, hide, hide. Mm. So that kind of shaped my attitude and me going away from all that because my peers weren't doing it. It's so interesting how our uh, worldview at times especially when we are children, is shaped by the opinions and views of our peers, right? And mm -hmm. children can sometimes be very, uh, very negative mm -hmm. and, uh, well, physically and emotionally. And that's where all the bullying comes up, right? Uh, right. We assume that all children are innocent, but sometimes, uh, you know, depending on what the age is, your peers can either empower you or they can like fully put, put you down, right? And like you pointed out, sometimes powerful ideas that are stemming from home, mm -hmm. you tend to forget it because your peers are not doing it. You don't have the information, so you forget your own information. Right, right. Yeah, and children are like sponges. They're just absorbing what they're absorbing from their parents. So if the parents have been putting them down, then that's their way of expressing their affection for someone. Yes, yes, that's very true. And I, and as you you know spoke about your own grandmom, I remember my maternal grandmom used to have this ritual for cleansing mm. and she used to you know heat up some spices in the stove and then she used to put that in a paper and then she yeah. would sort of you know wave that around my body in an energetic ritual and then she used to burn that paper Beautiful. and back in those days i used to think well, you know what is this you know, it doesn't make sense but now that i've embarked you know, when I embarked on my energy healing journey and understanding what energy really is, it totally made sense. And even back in those days, when she did that, I would feel that energetic shift. So mm. it's crazy how much knowledge and wisdom our grandparents had, right? Yes, absolutely. Shamanic healing is part of Ayurvedic healing as well. Shamanic, mantric, all that is part of Ayurveda. Mm -hmm. So talk to us about Kerala. What is the connection mm. between Ayurveda and Kerala? So Ayurveda really was uh, came through the civilization that was known as Bharatvarsha, India, as the primitive India of 5,000 years ago. And that was in the Indus Valley civilization, which is the part, which is the Sindh Valley, which is in modern day Pakistan right now. So Pakistan and Afghanistan are all birthplace of Ayurveda, if you believe it, you know birthplace of Ayurveda and yoga and all these Vedic culture, the Vedic culture. And because the climate started to change, because things, something started to shift, the river valley started to dry up. This mm -hmm. culture now started to move towards the Gangetic Plain, which is inward towards India, past New Delhi, the, the heart, heartland of India. So we have Ayurvedic classics surviving from the time of Vagbhata, who was in Pakistan, and also Sushruta from Varanasi, Kashi, which is this amazing uh, temple town that has been forever 
uh, inhabited by humanity. And once the knowledge came there, it started to spread with the Buddhist monks. You spoke about the debates, the Buddha, the, the Hindus and the Buddhists debating. So that time when the Hindus and the Buddhists were existing in uh, relative peace and uh, sharing of great ideas and this education, many Buddhist teachers traveled with this knowledge to all parts of the world. They went to Sri Lanka, they went as far to Japan, through Tibet, uh, through Korea, and they also moved down and came down to Kerala. So Kerala was an extremely remote you know, part of India. It's surrounded by forest. It is almost impossible to get to Kerala if because of the mountains and the forest in between. So they probably came through the ocean is what is uh, supposed, you know. Uh, and these Buddhist monks, they were either one or several, they brought with them the Ashtanga Hridaya, the classical manual that was written, I believe, like 600 BC or something like that. Different uh, archaeologists have different ideas on the dates. So when they got that book, the when they presented it themselves to the court, the Maharajas were very open and educated. So they were like, yes, we want you guys here. Please teach us what you know. And we also have our own native wisdom. So let's mix it all together and see what fertilizes, what comes out of this. So eight special families were given to this, either Vagbata or his uh, disciples, to train as healers in this new modality. And so this is a book of like 7,000 verses. It's like the encyclopedia of healing of it was the first materia medica of a physician so mm -hmm. these eight families are called ashtavadyas ashta meaning eight vadyas meaning healers doctors and this eight families still exist and they have you know the offshoots of these families still exist and because kerala never was under the direct rule of the british the british did their utmost in the 1835 18 that around that time there was a big movement by the British ruling colonial power to kill off all that which uh, created, inculcated pride in the Indian native population because they wanted a subdued, a timid, uh, colonized India. Yeah. That was in their interest rather than a powerful yoga doing, Ayurveda doing, empowered India. So they started to wipe off all our traditions, all our knowledge. It was systematic, it was thought out, it was strategic. Whereas in Kerala, because of our remoteness, because the British never directly ruled us, we were able to preserve that classical form of Ayurveda. We were able to add more to it and we were able to develop a very special flavor of Ayurveda. Did that answer the question? Oh, it did definitely. Thanks a lot for sharing. And I'm sure that people who are listening right now are also realizing something new about India that they probably did not know. A lot of people that they, when they think about India, you, what usually comes to mind is, you know, Delhi and Mumbai and Calcutta, mm -hmm. but Kerala, for those who are trying to visualize it is in the Southwest of India. And that's what happened. And so historically the the Hindu Maharajas of Kerala were known to be very welcoming, right? Because mm -hmm. not only did they welcome the, the Buddhist monks, like you've mentioned from the North, but they also, if you think about it, uh, welcomed some Arab merchants to mm -hmm. allow them to build one of the first mosques in the world in Kerala. Yeah. And mm -hmm. also the uh, Jewish settlements, they welcomed them, welcomed Christians. If you have a large you know, Syrian Christian community. So it seems like Kerala, Kerala was like a, uh, was a hot part of a mixture of different cultures and ideas and concepts. And that's what allowed them to, to thrive. And I didn't know this. I didn't know that Kerala was never under direct British rule, even back in the day. But this sort of makes sense that the essential wisdom was still retained, which is, which mm -hmm. is wonderful for India. <laughs> yeah, and these original eight families, uh, they were not just Hindus, they were Muslim and they were also Christians. So the traditional knowledge is held by Christian Vedyas and Muslim Vedyas. So uh, do not be surprised if you go to Kerala and a Muslim uh, Vedya shows up and prays 
in his way for you and don't be like oh no no you can't be the true guy you know you can't be the original lineage holder he absolutely is interesting so they practice a different religion but they they practice ayurveda at the same time ayurveda is not hindu ayurveda has a part of it as hindu because the hindu vedas practice it but there is definitely it's it's a non denominational it is about god wonderful so what made you get into wellness travel then take us back to that time where you decided that you know you want to help people travel but for wellness this was 2015 and um, my life had just come to a point where everything had just completely crashed i was married to my ex husband and uh, i was trying to conceive a second baby and i was uh, going about it like an a type achiever that you know i needed to get it done and i had a uh, five miscarriages in a span of 3 years and that january 2015 was my fifth miscarriage and then after that everything just came crashing and that um, summer i decided to go back home to my mother because i felt like the place i was in i could not get myself out of it anymore i was completely gone mentally physically on all levels spiritually So when I went home to Kerala I got to my mother and she took one look at me and she said we are going to do an ayurvedic healing we are going to do a panchakarma So even though I grew up in the family I had never heard the word panchakarma before because only physicians do panchakarma mm. So when I went to this retreat by the beach side where I did my panchakarma every day was like a revelation every day something incredible was happening in my body in my energetic space in my mind my faith my belief in myself and i felt myself broken into pieces and then put back together one by one and it was the most incredible experience of my life and by the end of it i felt like that 5 year old girl i always had felt in my heart and i felt my strength return i felt my felt my faith return my belief in god return i had visions about my future i had my purpose laid in front of me i looked at my body and i was like for the first time saying oh my god i'm actually good looking you know mm. these kind of things were happening to me and when that happened i was like I want every woman to experience this. I want every human being to experience this. This is like being in love but with myself. And I wanted everybody to know this feeling. So because we suffer so much in the west. You know, we I went through 10 years of that pain, nearly 10 years of pain with no relief in sight. And mm. here was the answer 7000 air miles away, a couple of thousand dollars away, 21 days and i was restored back to this powerful state of mind and body i was like why not and i came back home i just created my website got help from my brother who's a animator and a you know a artist and i started to document my experience and then my best friends were the ones the first ones to Uh, encourage me and say let's all go to kerala let's all feel what salila has experienced let's all have a taste of this and so the wellness travel agency began wonderful um so you took this well firstly you took advice of your mom you listened to her and you decided to do the panchakarma and like you mentioned that when you initially went for that you know that therapy um initially you broke down right mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so talk to us about that what happened there so the, one of the major parts of panchakarma is that first there is a breaking down you know everything that we create this scaffolding of this ego to keep prop this organism up this organism of what we think i am what i think you are we have all these props to keep ourselves up as long as those Uh, you know beliefs and props are still lying around we are not able to shift back into our natural self so panchakarma has this amazing effect of breaking that down 
and it literally is like a melting and a breaking and these are only the words i can use to share my experience with you and to articulate my experience that it feels like a breaking down it feels like a shattering it feels cruel at times especially if we've had a really thick carapace if we've had a thick mask that we've created to protect ourselves from mm. life you know we've insulated ourselves then that breaking feels very painful and mm. um it is wonderful to have a friend go with you or to have someone like me who can guide you through that experience or a partner go with you you know who can support you during that time or or a physician who's very knowledgeable about this so that we can continue to stay supported and because it 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 is a state of great panic when we completely break loose and we are like shivering and shaking will i ever be put back together right you've experienced this you you've been on a spiritual journey you know what i'm talking about oh yeah i'm not specifically experienced to panch karma but as it does happen in a spiritual journey you are forced to confront your own uh, fears and challenges i mean to me life is one big ayahuasca experience <laughs> all right and uh, but then you know if just because there's darkness it doesn't mean it's going to be dark forever there's going to be uh sunshine and the most brightest sunshine usually follows the darkest part of the night that's what i do believe so what specifically within that panchakarma or what what's happening in there that sort of stimulated that sense of um breaking down and you you know releasing walk mm-hmm. us through if you if you can from your perspective mm-hmm. what was what was happening there that you know started it for you the breaking down so to speak <laughs> yeah so living in the west we are so we are so disconnected from each other right we we share pleasantries but we do not go into depth we do not especially as immigrants we do not get to um feel affection and deep unconditional love the way we feel with our families with the way we feel have you traveled to india have you traveled to the to the southeast or asia you I have have I? i have yeah yeah so, so you can see a very distinct way people are there that it's so easy for people to open their hearts and be smiling and welcoming and offer you affection and expect nothing in return if you're traveling to asia you will experience that many times but in the west we constantly live in a state of not enough not enough not enough keep trying keep trying keep failing keep failing right but in the east in asia we constantly experience you are amazing you are amazing you are amazing so when we are living here these concepts keep building up in our mind that this is the way life is we are not going to get a lot of physical affection we are not going to get a lot of emotional affection but we got to somehow keep pushing keep doing keep pulling through and we will achieve something that house that job that retirement fund whatever it is that college and then life will be great so that's the that's what we keep doing and when we go to a panchakarma center and we actually meet these people who open their hearts up and they touch us and talk to us and they do these massages on our bodies and it feels like oh my god what was i thinking why did i miss out on all this i mm. should be living among people who will love me like this as a human being i should be loved like this my skin is to be touched my body is to be loved my self is to be loved and mm. then all those false notions start breaking and then yeah. everything that kind of keeps that alive we start questioning it and saying why can this be my reality why can i have people around me who love me like this mm. and so therefore the breaking and the restructuring yeah that's so fascinating um i think sometimes we underestimate our need for touch right and mm-hmm. for hugs and touch and appreciation and unconditional love and uh i think most people might be remembering that even more so now because everyone's 
being so forced isolated. to social distance, right? So do you think that's have, having an impact on us collectively? Absolutely. The fact that we're not really, you know, firstly, we're not getting even a shake hand. We're not getting a hug. We're not even able to see a person smile in front of you because mm-hmm. the person's face is covered with a mask. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think about nine out of 10 clients that come to me now, everybody's talking about stress, everybody's talking about sleeplessness, you know, missing affection, feeling lonely. I myself have to like do so much to stay on, to meet all my demands. I have to do stuff I've never done before to just yeah. stay normal, stay baseline. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, so no wonder that when you had that experience, um, especially of massage, which can be intimate because somebody is touching you and they are therapeutically stimulating certain points in your body, right? And using these beautiful oils Mm -hmm. of various kinds, it forces you to question what is reality. I should have received this years back. Why am I getting it right now? Yeah. Okay. The skin, you know, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, go ahead. I don't want to lose my thought. The The skin is called twak in Sanskrit. And twak means that which needs to be touched. So for the skin, twak. our largest organ, for it to be healthy and for it to function, it needs to be touched every day. Just like our eyes need to see, our ears need to hear, our mouth needs to speak. The skin needs absolutely to be touched every day. Right. Twak. And in Hindi, it's Twacha. Twacha. Right? So it, I guess, yes. stems from there. Uh, but that's interesting. So that which needs to be touched. And so you've explained your connection to Kerala. Uh, but you also do, you know, you take people to Bali as well. So what made you start taking people to Bali? Like, what's the connection with Bali? <laughs> Bali is another spiritual place where Hinduism is exists as it was practiced thousands of years in the north of India before India was colonized and a lot of those practices were wiped away. So when I was in Bali, I was actually told that the Hindu Parishad visits Bali to study Hinduism as it was, you know, thousands Uh of years ago. So I do not personally take people to Bali. My retreat, my wellness concierge books trips to Bali for Panchakarma. Uh, so yeah, I do not personally go. I have a ten-year-old daughter, and I have responsibilities. So I do one or two trips in a year, which mm-hmm. are group trips. I have not done that lately, but as soon as the flights are on, I think I'm going to go. I'm going to announce a group trip. Cool. And also, I've been for the longest time mm-hmm. wanting to, you know, host a retreat. Yes. And add value for people in terms of breath work. So maybe if we can collaborate in some way, that would be awesome. We can talk about it. <laughs> Such an honor. Thank you. Cool, cool. Awesome. And so, you know, uh, you've mentioned that you've had some synchronicities in your life, right? Mm-hmm. And many of our listeners, as they have this awakening in their life, they tend to have certain synchronicities, whether it's mm-hmm. seeing numbers or patterns or, you know, seeing people or noticing colors, insects, animals. You know, you name it. So talk to us about the synchronicity that you had uh, with Paramahansa Yogananda. Mm. Synchronicity with Paramahansa Yogananda. Now I have to bring all my skeletons out of the cupboard. (laughs) 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 So Paramahansa Yogananda, when I was at the Ayurveda retreat undergoing my Panchakarma, yeah. And I was having all these out-of-body experiences, my energy field expanding, collapsing, feeling people's aura and, you know, just waking up and walking around the ground still four in the morning and still being like a energizer bunny all day long. I was having all these incredible experiences and I was asking many questions in my mind, like, what on earth is this body made of? I am clearly not just this body. There is some reality beyond this that I'm not getting. I'm not understanding. What is this God? Lead me, lead me. And I, in one of these quests, in one of these thinking walks, I reached the library of the retreat and they had a lot of spiritual volumes. And I went in and I, my hands just went to this little red cover and I pulled out a book 
and it said our autobiography of a yogi. And I opened the book and I read a page. And I was like, this is fantastic. What on earth is this? This does not even sound like the truth. How could somebody write like this? You know? Uh, and then I was like looking at all the people's faces. The, there were all these amazing looking, resplendent yogis looking back at me. Mm. These beautiful, luminescent eyes. And I was like, these guys could not have been lying. What on earth is this? How could this be possible? If you've read the autobiography of a yogi, you know what I'm talking about. Like by location and people mm -hmm. appearing and disappearing. And it's like, how could you write something like this and publish it? Who, who wrote this? Paramahansa yeah. Yogi. All right, put him back. I was like, I don't know what that was, but I hope I, I figure out someday what that was. And I check out of the retreat and I come home. And I, uh, my daughter was starting preschool. My daughter was starting kindergarten that year. And I had chosen a very special school for her because everything about that school felt right to me. And when I went to drop her off when the first day of uh, school, I'm walking around the school grounds. And I'm like, this school is just amazing. This school is amazing. There's something wonderful about this school. And I look at a bronze statue of a yogi in the courtyard. I had not previously seen this. And I'm looking at that bronze statue and I'm like, oh my God, this bronze statue looks like that person in that book that I had read at the retreat. What is going on? There is this bronze statue. Mm. And then I come back home and a couple of days pass and I'm like thinking that was a coincidence. I picked up a school for my daughter that was built on the principles as laid by Paramahansa Yogananda Guruji. And I was like, fine, it was a coincidence. Uh, I'm not going to think more about it. And then when I had come back from my Ayurveda retreat, my marriage was on the rocks. So my ex-husband and I were talking about moving forward with the dissolution. And one day I come back from school and he is packing up and leaving. He's decided to separate. And I'm standing in the garage watching everything getting taken out. And there's like a big pile of books that he has left behind. So I'm in shock. I'm standing in the garage. There's this pile, five feet, one inch, as tall as I am, of books in front of me. And as he drove away, now I can now explore and see what's left in the house. And I see, okay, there's this big pile of books he has left behind. I pick up the first book on the top and guess what it was? The Autobiography of a Yogi. And at that moment, I felt like he was truly guiding me even before I knew I was on the path of right. spiritual evolution of this marriage which had been my rock for over nine years and now dissolving mm. and he was there to hold me as it was dissolving and something was being taken away from me and his book became my raft his book became the thing that I kept by my pillow and slept with and read out of and just soaked like a sponge so I could get through the next two years till the process was complete. God, a wonderful story. Thanks for sharing. And uh, listeners, if you're listening right now, and if you've had a synchronicity in the past, or maybe, you know, just today, and especially if it's related to Paramahansa Yogananda, make sure you message me or email me so that we can really, you know, be like a mastermind and share what each other is experiencing. But uh, Salila, I've also had a similar experience. And that's why I wanted to ask you this. Because when I was a kid, I still remember that on the way to school, and on multiple occasions, actually, I saw a poster hmm. of Paramahansa Yogananda looking back at me. And I didn't know anything about the book or anything about his background. But I thought it was pretty fascinating that this person, it feels as if this person is looking straight at me. Mm -hmm. And I remember that um, he, I remember making this note in my mind that he kind of looks like my dad. And so there was mm -hmm. like a mental note, you know, pay attention. So that was one. Uh, but then over the years, I came across guests of mine who in some way or the other are connected to Paramahansa Yogananda or Babaji. 
Mm-hmm. So, for example, Dan Brule met Baba Ji when he had come to India. Sri M, he met Baba Ji. Ellen O'Brien, she is one of the direct lineage, you know, uh, holders or teachers from uh, Paramahansa Yogananda. She is based in California, and she sent me books. Nice. You know, with like these are like thirty, forty year old books, and she sent it to me wow. about Kriya Honor. Yoga, right? And so it's like. i also like yourself i feel i've been guided along this path and uh, kriya yoga is definitely one of the things that i would like to practice more of but also serve people with because i think that the connection to baba ji and paramahansa yoga yogananda is really really powerful it's you know it, it cannot be explained like like what's you know written in the book the siddhis of people being able to manifest and disappear and you know levitate and teleport it's crazy <laughs> but i think all indians have this cellular memory right like we know these things happened this was possible in our indian civilization and there was ram and krishna we know that mm-hmm. and now you know through excavations and and findings we're we're just confirming what we all always knew through our prayers or through our stories and just through our dna so right. thanks for sharing <laughs> you're welcome right so i mean i think if there's one thing that people are realizing now that no matter what challenges they are going through they're always being guided by some supreme being or spiritual guide you talk about being in the present moment a lot right so what is learning to be in the present moment do for you you don't get triggered as much when you're in the present moment everything you're able to um access our capacity to be compassionate to another person suffering and we are able to see that anyone who is not loving is actually suffering anything other than love is suffering is a product of suffering whether it's anger disgust or pain anything you know some mm. things are obvious some things are not but anyone who is able to love has transcended their suffering so when we are in the present moment i am able to access my compassionate side for others and i am able to access my loving side for myself and for others compassionate side for also myself yes yes i'm able to see my suffering also and mm. being in the present moment helps me detach that experiencer from the experienced from what's mm. happening the awareness shifts and i'm able to see those two aspects of me you know one the ego and then my awareness and then the awareness is able to see the tantrums of the ego and say like you poor thing you have so many dreams you have so many wishes i'm sorry it's not coming true for you but it's okay we are still breathing the sun is still out we can do something enjoyable with this moment right now that's mm. what it's for me when i'm in the present moment i'm able to access that part of me that is able to love and forgive yeah that's very very useful actually because you spoke about love right but not the love that people think about it is especially one that is portrayed in the movies but this is a love that transcends the need for you to receive love from the other person so it's unconditional love uh but just not for the other person but also for yourself right. and like you've said that you're able to distance yourself from the person who is experiencing these emotions mm-hmm. and be the witness mm-hmm. and then objectively you know take your time with it mm-hmm. And so I guess Vedanta is connected a, a lot of Vedanta philosophy is connected with Ayurveda right I am not sure about that but yes Ayurveda is from the Rigveda so Vedanta is different from the Veda right Vedanta is more of a where a more of an intellectual looking into this nature of life and philosophy of meaning of life right I'm not educated in that go ahead Yeah I mean based on what I understand Veda Anta so mm-hmm. Veda is the ultimate uh, learnings of or the summary of ev- everything that the Vedas were about so the the, the last phase and based on the little, little knowledge that I have about Vedanta 
this, you know, separating yourself and being the observer was what I learned through Vedanta, which is why mm -hmm. I remarked. But, but I guess that's part of all the sciences of, of yoga and Ayurveda. So that's yeah. interesting. It, it's a it's a khichdi. It's a part of khichdi, you know. Yeah. <laughs> everything <laughs> informs the other and everything enhances the other and flavors the other. <laughs> very, very true. Uh, and so you talked about this a bit before, but, um, you know, in terms of the origins of Ayurveda and some of the ancient rishis and physicians that saw, sort of propagated Ayurveda back in the day, could you, could you expound on that a little bit? Yeah, so Ayurveda, the, there's this fantastical origin story of Ayurveda. And then there are these physician scientists. I call them sage scientists because they were sage scientists. Like Atreya, Nagarjuna, Vagbata, Shushruta. You know, these gentlemen were, they were products of lineages of knowledge. And then they were the ones who wrote it all down, who mm. had these uh, Nagarjuna was a Buddhist and yeah. Jivaka, Buddha's own personal physician, again, a Buddhist. And uh, the Buddha himself is called Bhesha Jaguru, the guru of all healers. He himself was an Ayurveda physician. He himself, they did not call themselves Ayurveda physician. They were healers. They were physicians. Yeah. They, they used all the tools they knew. And at each time, uh, different these great intellectual minds decided to write it down because the knowledge was getting scattered. It was within several clans and new things were coming in that was distorting it. So they like pulled it all together and created an encyclopedia and passed it on. So these guys were actually doing cadaver dissections. Mm. So there's uh, information about it in Sushruta's uh, way of describing soft tissue and the, the harder tissues of the body like his soft tissue knowledge is off and from that the archaeologists are able to deduce that they were studying decaying corpses from the ganges to understand anatomy and physiology so these guys were scientists they were like uh, looking at stuff and saying they were making their hypothesis they were testing it trial and error these were all they had a scientific uh, procedure just as scientists have it right now. You know, you mm -hmm. make a hypothesis, you do your experiment, and then you look at your results. And uh, so these guys were absolutely uh, following these methodologies. Yeah, so there you go, Action Tribe. But it was not just, you know, a bunch of people coming together and, and doing some healing. It was a very advanced level of medicine, right, which had absolutely. different branches and they were like scientists trying to replicate the same outcome and testing and experimenting and hypothesizing so it was an interesting time in india back in the days and uh so salila you you've mentioned that ayurveda just like yoga has an ashtanga also right eight branches mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so could you give us an overview of some of the branches before I give you that, I quickly want to say that Shushruta is actually the father of surgery all over the world. He's the father of cosmetic surgery and the father yeah. of surgery. And the procedure of uh, nasal reconstruction is the Indian is an Indian um, is something that India has given to the world. So, so yeah, they were not just a bunch of guys just flapping with their backs, coming up with stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 so for sure. Yoga has the, the I believe eight is a good number. So different uh, Vedas, different streams of knowledge have divisions of eight to kind of, uh, Indians were the original encyclopedia writers. They love studying things to death. You know, we, yep. we love to study a subject and really understand it, classify it, codify it, write it down. Um, we love those bullet points. We were the original bullet point makers. So in Ayurveda also, there were eight branches of uh, different types of medicines that they studied. So some of it was associated with the mind, psychiatry, some of it with the children, some of it with the geriatrics, some of it surgery, some of it is women's health, gynecology. So those eight branches comprise the eight branches of 
medicine of that created an entire holistic ayurvedic medicinal system yeah interesting it just gives context to people who are listening as to how advanced our medicine was back in the day and like to your to your point uh india gifted or india india was the one who you know um inspired the rest of the world to do plastic surgery rhinoplasty because i think there was a britisher who noticed a cobbler performing you know this version of rhinoplasty on a street of pune mm-hmm. where he you know took a flap out from a from the person and and stitched it back in and that sort of they took that story back in in london and they were like what are these guys doing this is amazing and what can we learn from them mm-hmm. absolutely yeah so uh you know speaking about ayurvedic rituals now or maybe some routines what are some you know rituals that you do on an ongoing basis that you know really help you so there are several ayurvedic rituals that anybody would benefit from if they began to practice these rituals are again another set of tools for us to create some supportive framework for our day yeah. so that you know our uh throughout the day as we are waking up the sun is rising the temperature is increasing falling humidity is increasing falling the energies within our body the vata pitta kapha the vata of the movement energy pitta the metabolism the alkali acid balance and the kapha the ability of the body to be stable to for everything to stay together the hydration within the body it is constantly getting challenged and these ayurvedic rituals help to keep these energies in balance and then help to help us stay in a balanced state of mind samatva same as yoga balance is the goal of ayurvedic rituals so when we wake up in the morning one of the first ayurvedic ritual in the west that i would love for everybody to practice is for stung scraping Mm. you know because we wake up with a lot of bacteria on the tongue it is dead bacteria it is ama ama meaning toxins and if we have a habit of scraping it away then it does not pass into our body with our food with our first drink and then that toxicity stays in the body that rna dna of that dead bacteria is more available for the body to who knows what might happen it's best to just cleanse that out and then the second practice i really would love everybody to you know explore i invite people to try it out uh, is an oil bath an oil abhyanga massage so we take a nice nourishing organic uh expel pressed oil like a sesame oil or even olive oil almond oil we apply it all over our body over our head around our ears on our navel uh be- the soles of our feet uh and uh, we keep this on our body for about 15 minutes we do a- some kind of light yoga stretching prayer meditation at that time then wipe it off and take a warm bath and this is a powerful way to stay young longer this is a youth elixir this is an amazing way to bring the mind calm to calm the mind down to you know reduce the tendency of the mind to flare up in some kind of heightened emotion this is an excellent way to keep the skin healthy we spoke about touching is important so this is the way we nourish our skin and give the skin a beautiful loving touch so that is the second uh ritual that i would invite everyone to try out and then the third thing is to pay attention to our diet and to not drink cold water so much anymore especially when the temperatures are falling and to drink warm teas like i am drinking my warm tea right now this has black cumin and uh, black seed and some dry ginger so this is a warming tea i am drinking throughout the day to help flush the toxins from my body so th- these are three rituals i would like to talk about that if everybody in america in north america practiced i think it would be wonderful a lot of our flared up emotions would come down <laughs> that's interesting because i think as an indian there are certain things that you just do and you don't consider it a you know like a ayurvedic routine or ritual it's because right. you've been doing that all your life and 
I'm going like, wait, doesn't everyone scrape their tongues? <laughs> because I My have been doing this. My daughter's American, she doesn't. <laughs> no, yeah. And so, you know, I've been doing this by watching my father and mom do this at home. So that's one. Um, and the second thing you mentioned is... The abhyangam. The abhyangam. The abhyangam. Yeah. abhyangam. Yeah. So the massage, the oil massage or the abhyangam, what I wanted to mention was, you know, when I was a kid also, um, whenever I would get a headache or whether I would, you know, I would, I would get like a mouth ulcer or something like that. My dad would automatically say, you need to get an oil, oil bath. <laughs> mm, for most of the that. issues, for most of the issues, there was always, you know, go get an oil bath. And, you know, at first I didn't take it really seriously because I couldn't, you know, um, see the connection. Mm-hmm. I couldn't see the why. But now it all makes sense, you know, as I grow older and, you know, get more curious and learn how the body works. It all is connected and and it, and it makes sense. So you said uh, sesame oil or, or, or coconut oil? Coconut oh. oil is great in summer when it is uh, melted. Mm-hmm. But in winter, please do not use coconut oil because it's hard. It's not as effective. When a co- when an oil has hardened, it's basically saying, don't use me. I'm not good for you. Mustard oil, right? I think you mentioned. Mustard oil is excellent in winters, but mustard oil is very sharp. Mustard yeah. oil has a lot of enzymes, so we should be careful about applying it on our face and our private parts. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Got it. This is a good reminder for me to also do an oil bath, maybe today itself, after my workout, after this interview. But you feel so refreshed after <laughs> an oil bath. You feel so nourished and so taken care of as if you're stepping out of a sauna. Yeah. Uh, uh, but but uh, in terms of other sort of stuff that I do particularly, I love intermittent fasting. Mm-hmm. You know, I do some level of fasting and sometimes I might just have one meal in a day, which is very popular. You know, it's getting more and more popular mm-hmm. as people learn the importance of autophagy and, you know, how the body responds to you not eating all the time. But right. w- what does Ayurveda say about fasting? Ayurveda is absolutely on board with fasting. Ayurveda is probably one of the first medicine systems that uses fasting as a therapy, as a healing modality. So langana is the word for fasting. And, uh, um, you know, whenever anybody presents with uh, any kind of health concern, the Ayurveda physician looks at them and says, should I do langana or should I do brahmana? Langana yeah. meaning fasting, reducing the body mass, and brahmana means nourishing, improving, tonifying, and adding more nourishment into the body. And we are all in the West, even in the East now, even all over the world, globe. All of us have too much nutrition. All of us have too much food in our bodies. We are not yeah. working as much. So intermittent fasting is, uh, Ayurveda has, we, we don't even feel hungry. There's a beautiful protocol. We don't even feel hungry. We wake up in the morning. The first food of the morning is a tablespoon of ghee. And Mm. once we have taken the ghee with some nice warm water, that ghee passes through our system. It goes into every cell. And we don't feel hungry till about 11, sometimes even 1. And when we feel really hungry, that's when we have some kind of a congee, some kind of a light gruel diet. And then we have a light dinner at maybe 6 o'clock. And I did this kind of fasting for nine days during the Navratras. And I have to tell you, AJ, my mind was so crazy before that because of the COVID and all the stress and all these Zoom calls. Yeah. Nine days later, my mind is was crystal clear, sharp, so much better than before. My body is so much more energetic than before. And not in those nine days did I feel hungry. Or did I feel desperate for food? I felt nourished. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think the body is is marvelous in its able to in its ability to adapt uh, to the positive stress that sometimes we apply on it. Uh, but you know, teaching your body to not be dependent on so much of food and eating within an interval for me as well has been so. Yeah, so amazing. Firstly, it's more convenient because I don't have to make food all the time, <laughs> and, and 
And secondly, uh, when I do make the food, it becomes more of a ritual. It becomes more of a routine because my body is at that point is really looking forward to the food. And when I do have the food, invariably, I'm taking into consideration, you know, the greens, having mm-hmm. some healthy fat, some nuts, mm-hmm. maybe some, you know, some meat and, uh, you know, mixing it all up, having a balanced diet and having adequate food to last me another 16 hours or so. Yeah. So. Yeah, Ayurveda yeah. says hita mita ahara means good food cooked with a lot of love, a little bit of quantity. People don't realize that, right? Because there is love that goes into food, right? Mm-hmm. A person who is really good at cooking, highly trained, mm-hmm. if they don't have the love that goes in, the food turns out bad, right? Absolutely. I'm a trained chef, so it, when I cook <laughs> for myself, I, yeah. bef- you know, because of COVID, because I have so much to do, I was just yeah. throwing things together and just cooking something. I'm like, I know how to cook. I'll just throw five things. It'll be edible. Yeah. But when I slowed down during my Navratra fast and I was cooking because I was offering the first morsel to the goddess at my altar. So I was cooking with care. I was cooking with fresh ingredients. I was putting a lot of love into that food. I felt that love. And for the first time, I had the experience that I pray for myself. I pray. My prayer is a selfish self-care technique, actually. I'm not praying for God. I'm not praying for something to break loose and happen in the universe. I'm praying for this body, for its longevity. Yeah, that's interesting. And what comes to my mind is they've done a lot of research now, especially to find out that um, water can Mm -hmm. hold vibration right yeah and so they did that experiment right with this where they said some expletives bad words to the water and it formed certain patterns and then you know another group of water where it was all about loving words and it was a different sacred pattern and i think the same thing can be with food also because you know uh, food is well some some part is solid but then you have the dals and the curries and the liquid stuff right so if you right if you have the right intention that goes into it, it you know it can really nourish you at a at a much higher level. That's I think what the essence of prasad is all about, right? Mm-hmm. It's blessed yeah. food. Blessed food, food that blesses, food that is blessed. So you do a lot of journaling as well, right? <clears throat> I mean, journaling has played a very important role in in your in your journey. So, what's your process like for for journaling? I love writing, so I don't uh, don't call it journaling. I don't pick a journal and write in it. My yeah. blogging becomes it, it becomes a way of expressing my thoughts. Now I like leave comments on Instagram is also part of journaling now, you know, because Instagram, yeah. the people I follow, a lot of them are wonderful people who make these thought provoking posts and my journaling extension then becomes sharing what I'm thinking with them. That has become my community. This community is now coming through the phone. Yeah. That's my family now. And yep. my blog becomes my community. Everywhere where I write, even if it is a text message, that becomes my journaling. That becomes a place where I am uh, airing my thoughts, getting perspective, clearing up things for myself. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I do not believe in going round and round in circles with my own drama. I need to have something to think and then process and gain perspective. And uh, I'm, I'm only too aware of the tendency of the mind to write the same thing over and over and over again. When I've kept journals, I've noticed that. You know, you go on page one, 19, 1998, and Page 25, 2001, it's the same drama. Yeah. And so you maintain your journal since 1998? No, I'm just kidding. Okay. <laughs> I've, I've, I've moved home so many times that yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm okay. constantly throwing stuff. I burn them before I throw them though. Okay. Because I know some people who've, you know, I've heard of some people who do that. And that's what I also intentionally want to do. Uh, which is why these days, you know, in the evening, I, I sort of journal what happened during the day, just so that, you know, like two years, three years down the line, 
<clears throat> I'm able to see what happened during that day and who I was, like what are my thoughts. Mm. Um, yeah, mm. so that's my little experiment that's going on. We'll see how long I'm able to carry this forward. That's uh, beautiful. As anything we do that is helping us grow and change mm. and shift, Anything that is in the service of our ego to stay where we were is bad. Even the best of tools and techniques in the service of our great intellect and ego uh, to stay where we were and to justify ourselves is not productive. But if it is helping us grow, then it doesn't matter what the tool is. It's wonderful. Yeah, that's that's very true too. I mean, sometimes we want to stay where we were. Because we prefer the the past, the comfort, the comfort of the past, uh -huh. compared to where we are. Because yeah. you know we feel like where we are right now is worse than the past, and mm -hmm. the human mind always wants to be better, 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 mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But yeah. it's hard to re reconcile, <clears throat> especially if you're going through a difficult time financially, relationship-wise, or health-wise, to mm -hmm. logically say I was better before. And now mm -hmm. I'm, you know, down. Mm -hmm. And that's why we, we seek to go from, go to the past, but that's not possible. You can't go in the past. Mm -mm. Right. Yeah. Sometimes I feel like, you know, there is healing even in the steeping. I, I like to call it my steeping. When I'm in trouble, I'm mm. like steeping like a tea bag in the hot water. And there is healing and growth even in the steeping. And yeah. there is healing in the staying steeped till I'm ready to come out of it. Yeah, that's true. I think the steeping creates a contrast for you to appreciate, you know, the the transition, the right. the abundance or the new expression of life that is waiting for you. So unless yeah. you go through the contrast, you won't be able to appreciate the difference. 100%. Yeah. Cool. And so... You know, speaking about rituals, um, over the last couple of weeks, I've been trying to, you know, improve my sleep. Mm. Um, and I've realized sometimes that my sleep quality is not up to the mark. So I wake mm. up feeling a little bit tired or maybe with a slight headache. Mm -hmm. And so what does Ayurveda say about, you know, improving sleep? What are some of those levers that we can pull in order to improve sleep quality? Mm. So diet, sleep and uh, our uh, sexual energy are the three main pillars on which our health stands. So if any of these are in trouble or any of these are not optimal, then naturally we are inviting disease at a much faster pace. So we must get all these three legs of the pillars of our health in place. Mm -hmm. So that's wonderful that you are aware that sleep needs a little bit more help. The first step to having good sleep is eating the proper diet that will help us sleep. So going before going to sleep, maybe having a, do you like to drink milk? Do you have a, a ritual of drinking milk? I don't drink milk, but what I am consuming these days is uh, some warm cacao. Mm -hmm. So pure mm. cacao, Peruvian cacao mixed with turmeric and curcumin, I mean, curcumin and uh, black pepper and MCT and all that good stuff, superfoods. I'm having that. And sometimes okay. I might have uh, another, uh, you know, drink, which is basically turmeric and, you know, the Ayurvedic turmeric milk, mm -hmm. but not mm -hmm. with the milk, but maybe I mix just hot water, some milk powder. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, would you be open to mixing it with milk and boiling it? Yeah, and I'm, I'll be open. Nutmeg. And checking if your milk, your turmeric mix has nutmeg. Nutmeg is a powerful relaxant. Nutmeg okay. that creates sleep in the body. So about a good pinch of nutmeg mixed with a um, turmeric powder and then milk, a cup of milk and half a cup of water. And then cook down that half a cup of water so that the milk breaks down is more easily digestible so you are not able, you are not woken up because of indigestion so drinking that before going to sleep will calm down help kick the metabolism then yeah. the second thing to think about is getting sunlight getting adequate sunlight um you're in vancouver right is yeah. it uh, is the gloom set in that you the 
is it gloomy is it uh, are you getting uh, much sun I think for the most part these days we're getting a lot of cloudy days but then in between we do get you know sunny days as well. Yeah. So that happens. Like today I uh, you know it was it was sunny in the morning so when I woke up I did a short breath work session but I made sure that when my eyes was closed I could feel the sun you know coming through my eyelids. So Beautiful. Beautiful. If you could get about 15 to 30 minutes of sunlight on your skin but you know avoiding 11 to 3 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. because that's when the ozone layer you yeah. know because of the yeah so if you could get from sunrise to 11 from 3 p.m. to sunset if you could get 30 minutes of good sunlight on your skin so sunlight that creates a lot of serotonin you know in uh, the the melatonin production in our body is directly related to how much sunlight we get and then serotonin is produced in our gut from the foods that we eat so if you are eating a good wholesome meal like you mentioned you are creating enough serotonin in your body and that serotonin gets converted to melatonin at night by the pineal yeah. gland so mm -hmm. food and uh, getting sunlight and getting some good breeze and you are already living a, a a life guided by ayurveda you're exercising you're conscious of your health what could be some things that are keeping you uh from having a peaceful mind before going to sleep um i think one thing i'm mindful of is i need to get those uh, blue blocking glasses mm -hmm. and maybe the next time i do an interview you might see me with these <laughs> orange glasses okay. to to you know to prevent prevent the blue light from entering my eyes so that's one, that's one thing i'm mindful of Uh, I also want to sleep a bit early. I mean, these days I'm sleeping at about eleven, eleven fifteen, eleven thirty ish. So I want to okay. make it, you know, continuously ten thirty. Right. And I'm guessing that that'll help me hit the right, you know, sleep cycles. Yes. And wake up more refreshed. So those two things uh, are there. I'm having the nightly drinks before going to sleep. Uh -huh. Other than that, maybe having a warm shower might help. You know. That'll relaxing. And Abhyangam. Oh, now Bhangam will help. Yes. One thing that really helps me is um, is paying attention to the state of mind before I'm going to sleep. Because mm -hmm. you know, you know this. You uh, our awareness is like a flashlight. Yeah. Wherever we leave it at night, as we are drifting away, is where yeah. we will find it in the morning. Yeah. And, very true. And if we have not practiced that sleep hygiene of taking that flashlight away from that naughty problem away from that friend who's not calling back or away from that email that we've been waiting to hear back about and just putting it onto something that is positive maybe a good word or a mantra you like to chant or god's name or something pleasant or an image of yourself in your happiest state mm. um, just placing it there as you're drifting away into sleep even practicing yoga nidra you know you prob probably do this all, you know already yeah i have some tracks with yoga nidra some beautiful brain wave audio tracks that i'm mm. trying out and experimenting with um but yeah i will definitely try out some of these other techniques and be more mindful of doing it every day uh, because you know with the intermittent fasting i've sort of you know mastered some part of it and i do cold exposure in the morning i have a cold shower nice but i think sleep sleep is going to be my next avenue and i will <laughs> share with everyone what i what i learn uh, <laughs> but but thanks uh, thanks lila for for sharing that with us and i and i know that our listeners now have so many different ideas and concepts that they can apply into their own life action drive as we are learning today everything is connected and the more we distance ourselves from nature through our food through our lifestyle through our habits the more we create an environment for illness and disease Absolutely. right so you need darkness but you need the sunshine as well we have an inner healer within that is awoken as soon as we detoxify and release the stress that is holding our nervous system down and in this regimen the food that we consume like we're learning can really act as medicine because as somebody as somebody once wisely put when diet is wrong medicine is of no use but when diet is correct then medicine 
is of no need. So with that being said, we're now at the last round for today, the wisdom round, so that our listeners can take note and they can take some action. So Salila, what is the best piece of advice that you have ever received? The best piece of advice I've ever received is uh, when I was a management trainee as a hotel management executive, I was told to praise in public and critique in private. So that has stood me well in my personal relationships and at work. That is something I take to heart and uh, abide by. And if you could turn back time, spend one time, one hour with someone who is living or dead, who would it be? Definitely Gandhiji. And I know you shared some routines with us, but what is that one thing that you do in the morning or evening, you know, before going to sleep that has improved the quality of your life? Something that extra that you'd like to share? Um, something other than what I've already shared? It could be something that you already shared also, but something that you'd like to emphasize. Yes, absolutely. The the, the flashlight uh, analogy I gave about where the mind is placed, where the awareness is placed before going to sleep, that we can we cannot have enough reminders about these things. You know, as I'm drifting to sleep, that consciously placing my awareness on something positive and then waking up in a much better frame of mind. Yeah, I think that's so useful, Action Tribe. When you're going to sleep and after you wake up, your mind, your brain is in a hypnagogic state. So it's very impressionable to the ideas that you receive. So if you watch a very toxic news channel before going to sleep, guess what? <laughs> it's going to be impressed into your subconscious mind, long-term memory. You might forget about what you what channel you watched, but that that's going to going to remain. So that's that's some really good advice. And if you could recommend one book for our listeners today, what would that be? I would love for everybody to read When the Body Says No by Dr. Gabor Mate. I think that's a phenomenal book. It answers a lot of questions about the health concerns that we have these days. Awesome. Action Tribe, this is your opportunity. This is your chance to get one book for free. And uh, that's because audible.com has been kind enough to allow all our listeners to get one free audible credit, which means that you can you know, go on to their website and download a book of your choice. In this case, When the Body Says No by Dr. Gabor Mate. So if you'd like to check this out, and most of these books are either read by the author themselves or someone who's really good at speaking, <laughs> but go to my 7 forward slash free book, my 7 forward slash free book to claim your free credit. So Salila, thank you so much for joining us today. Before you go, tell us something that you're grateful for and how can we find you? I'm grateful for the elders of my family who have loved me. I'm grateful that they're still around and I'm, they all know how to use WhatsApp. I'm very grateful for that. <laughs> you can find me on my Instagram, salila.ayurveda, or you can find me on my website. I'm everywhere. Ayurgamaya.com is my website. And if you want to go to India to do a Panchakarma healing, a detoxification, you want to get a total cultural immersion, hit me up. Wonderful. We'll have all these links up in the show notes. Action Tribe, this is a very exciting session. And if you've listened till so far, it means that you are a true and true listener of our show. There are many people who listen, but you know, very few, as you might imagine, because this is a long interview that listen till the very end. So if you would like to also try out a breathwork session, if you'd like to find out if it's really going to help you reduce your stress, then join me live. I do a monthly breathwork workshop for just 50 cents. That's right. Go to my 7 forward slash breathwork intro. Seven is a word, my 7 forward slash breathwork intro to get your ticket for just 50 cents. Join me and everyone else live on Zoom and let's breathe your stress away. And finally, if you're on Instagram, then take a screenshot of this episode, whether you're watching a video on YouTube or Facebook, or you're listening to this on your phone, take a screenshot and tag me and Salila. Uh, my handle is at my seven chakras. So tag me. And what is your uh, handle again? 
at salila my name dot ayurveda so salila dot ayurveda okay. so at my seven chakras and at salila dot ayurveda tag both of us so that we can share your story with our community and we can connect in that way and finally if you'd like to ask me any question any feedback any comment something at all my email is aj at my seven chakras dot com aj at my seven chakras dot com so salila thank you so much for joining us on this episode talking to us about the power of ayurveda and taking us one step closer to a human revolution oh thank you so much such a pleasure have a wonderful evening aj awesome so and